Good morning. Good to have you with us today. Uh, we are still meeting. I know there's a lot going on with COVID right now, and we're being careful and all the precautions are in place. But I'm glad I can meet with you this morning. If you can't be with us, uh, we're certainly glad to be able to meet this way. May the Lord just bless you with his word. We're in the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ, he's transforming all things. He will do that. He is doing that. And in our lives, if you know him as Savior, he's transforming your life. Chapter 1, just a reminder to us, it shows us Jesus Christ. John writes about the things that he has seen. He has seen Jesus Christ exalted and in glory. In our every day as we look to the Lord, we're looking with, with eyes of faith to this very Savior who is indeed exalted and glorified. That's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're mindful that this is the Savior that we serve. He is alive today. And one day we're going to be in his kingdom. We're going to be with him. John's writing about this. He lays out with magnificence the attributes, the qualities, the deity of Jesus Christ in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he's speaking to the church. Seven specific churches, but not only those seven churches, the churches that are around in Asia Minor and the church today, the church age. He's writing to his church. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. And so we're looking at these seven churches. Jesus Christ is transforming his church. He's doing that today. He's doing that right now. Because you're listening, if you know Jesus Christ, you're a part of this church. You're a part of this message. He's speaking to you and to I this morning. Transformation, we were reminded from, from Ephesus and Smyrna, the first two churches, uh, it's thriving in God's Word. It's, it's loving Him and being faithful to Him. It's pouring those qualities into our heart, letting Jesus Christ change our heart so that we would thrive. Uh, writing, writing the quality of a love relationship on our heart writing the quality of faithfulness to the Lord on our heart. And so we've seen that. In Ephesus, Jesus reminds us he loves us. He holds us. He dwells in the midst of the candlesticks and in the midst of his church. He's right there. He reminds us that without love, we're nothing. He calls us to rekindle that love. In Smyrna, he reminds us he is our victory. He is eternal. He is the first and the last. Yet he's always been, yet he stepped, he stepped into history and he overcame sin and death. He willingly did that. He didn't have to do that, but he did that for us. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? What, what grace? He stepped into history and he overcame on our behalf. And he calls us and he tells us, don't be afraid. And he says, be faithful. These are, these are things that we've seen. Today we're in chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. Just a reminder to us as we come to these verses in this passage, that we are, we are accountable to Jesus Christ. He loves us, um, and he is faithful to us, yet at the same time, he is our victory. He calls us now to be accountable to him. He's running again to these seven churches. We are now looking at Pergamum, the third church. John is in exile. He's writing God's word. He's been excommunicated for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Two things that Jesus does. He's writing to specific churches. So he reveals to these churches the need of the church, and then he shows the enablement of God for their life and their ministry. And so that's what we see here. We're in our third church now here. We're, we're in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. He's writing to the church of Pergamum, to the church and to the angel of the church and to the pastor of that church. He's writing to them. It's not angels because angels never lead are never leaders in the churches. Uh, we had that discussion earlier. Uh, Pergamum is very religious. Um, basically, religion is is worshiping anything or anyone other than God. It's putting a system into our life where we hope to be able to weigh the good, have the good outweigh the bad when we someday are accountable to God. The relationship is so different than that. It's found only in Christ. Pergamum has temples of so many kinds. They've They've been under Greek and Roman authority. Now under Roman authority, there are gods to the Greeks, God to the Romans, Zeus being chief among them. Uh, there are three temples alone that are dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor of Caesar. Um, they are called to worship Caesar, to call him Lord, to call him God. Temples are dedicated to that. If I refuse to do that, I will be persecuted. I will maybe even give up my life. And so the DNA, the culture of Pergamum is very dangerous, just like the DNA uh, of our world today for believers and for Christians. And so that's the world in which we operate and we're called to be a uh, witness and to be testimony. He evaluates every church. Jesus says, I know this about your church. 
He says in verse verse 13, I know, I know, I know. He's omniscient. He knows the church. He knew this church specifically. He knows you this morning. He knows Emmanuel. He knows our life. He knows everything about us. He says, I know where you dwell. Verse 13, where Satan's throne is and where Satan dwells at the end of that verse. He says, I know where you dwell. It is Satan's throne. It is Satan's dwelling place. For whatever reason, Jesus Christ identifies this city, this location, this place as the throne of Satan. I think that changes often in every generation, and at times throughout history it's changed often. Satan is always shifting and maneuvering and, and, and strategizing and, and operating where he has the most power. Here, because of all the pagan worship here, because of all the gods here, because of all those giving, being involved in, in satanic and sexual idolatry and all these things, uh, Satan is is work his his work has the most impact here. This is the very throne, the dwelling place of Jesus of of Satan. You know, when light and dark are together, they can't coexist. There's going to be spiritual warfare, and so that's exactly what's taking place. Persecution against believers and conflict is the reality. In chapter two, verse one, Jesus Christ is in the midst of the churches. He's dwelling with them. He's walking among them. He's holding us in his hands. This is Satan's dwelling place. But guess what? Guess what? Guess what? In this world, Jesus is there with us. We're not alone. We are in strength with him. We are in relationship with him. I love that. He says, I know where you dwell. And he says, I know your commitment. I know your commitment to me. We see it here in verse 13. You, yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you. You've held fast to my name, and you de haven't denied the faith. You have... You have been faithful to me, to Jesus Christ. You have stood strong. To name the name of Christ in this culture is going to, have, is going to be in incredibly consequential. In fact, Antipas has given his life. He's given his life. He refused to bow to Caesar, to emperor. He refused to honor him as Lord and God. And said, he says, I will honor Jesus Christ as my Lord and God. We don't know who he is. We don't know anything about him. But we know the most important thing about him. But if we knew nothing else about you or about me, if this could be said of us, this would be the most important thing. She, he, they, he, they were a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, he was my faithful witness. No better words of, of uh, a commendation could be given. May that be true of us in our testimony. This church is holding fast. This church is faithful to Christ. This church loves the Lord. This church is, is committed to the testimony, the witness of Jesus Christ. But he says, I have a negative here. So let's be honest about that. Let's put this on the table. You know, Jesus Jesus often would speak with love but with authority into, into the lives of disciples and believers so that they might learn and grow and change. That's what he does here. When we speak into the lives of one another, we do it as believers because we love each other, because, because we want each other to, to see Jesus Christ for who he is, to experience the, the power, the grace, the change that Jesus Christ is. We do it because we care. Jesus says, these things are true, but you, you have tolerated compromise. Verse 14 and 15. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam and who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. And so also you have some who hold the teaching of Nicolaitans. You have Balak and Balaam. We're going to see that in a second. Balaam is a prophet, but he would misuse his position, his role as authority. Balak is a king of a nation that's about to be conquered, and so he brings Balak into the picture to try to overcome Israel. We're going to see that here in a second. And so um, the church here is guilty of being lenient with sin. You have these who are following the, the principles of Balaam Balak, you have these who are following the principles of the Nicolaitans, which seem to be really closely intertwined. We don't know who the Nicolaitans are exactly for sure. We've talked about that. But what's true here is that compromise has been brought into the church. Idolatry has been brought into the church. In other words, all these temples, all these other forms of worship have been brought into the lives of believers here. Sexual immorality, which has been very much a part of the, of the worship culture and scene in these temples, has been brought into the lives of some. So they've said... Well, it's okay if, I, if I'm involved in sexuality. It's okay if I pinch incense at the altar of, 
of these gods or before the emperor. What difference does it make? I still follow Jesus Christ, so it's okay if I do this too. Jesus says, absolutely not. There's never room for compromise in our life if we're going to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. We're going to be a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. The Word of God always makes that distinction in our life, and the church has allowed that. Satan has tried a frontal assault. He has tried persecution, and it hasn't worked against this church. And so he's, he's bringing compromise into the church. You know, that's often what he does. If you have struggled in your life for a long time, when believers struggle, when I struggle, it's often compromise. It's little decisions that add up. It's a big decision that happens because I have been weak and weak and weak and weak and weakened over time through little decisions, and I'm, and I'm rotten underneath, and all of a sudden the structure just falls. Compromise. We can't afford to compromise in our life, ever. That's what's happened here in the church. Compromise is happening among some and among many. That's important. They've tolerated sin. Paul said to the church in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 9, you can read that later. He says, you've tolerated sin in your life to your shame. You need to deal with this. He's saying to the church here in Pergamum, you need to deal with this sin. So you hear Balaam and Balak. Balak is this king. He brings Balaam, calls Balaam alongside, he pays him money. He says, I want you to curse the people of Israel. I want you to curse God's people. They're too mighty for me. They're going to overwhelm me. They're going to conquer me. I can't, I can't stand against them. I've seen what God has done. I've seen how he's provided for them. I want you to curse them. Once well, you follow the narrative and st follow the story in Numbers 22 to 25, God, God prevents Balaam from doing this. Balaam cannot utter a curse. He is kept from uttering a curse. In fact, every time he tries to utter a curse, he is led by God to bless the people instead. Isn't that, isn't that power? He takes the words of, of Balaam and he turns them from what should be a curse into blessing. And, and it gets worse for Balak the king with every, every blessing that's given. And so Balaam says, I know a way you can overcome them. Right here in Numbers 25. And so the people begin to commit sexual immorality with the daughters of Moab. The, the women from the, from the pagan land intermarried with the people of Israel. And they invited the peep, their husbands and their families to worship their gods with them and, and compromise came into the nation. And this takes time and this takes this is this is a end around, this is a slow but but effective way of of uh, undoing the testimony of believers, and that's what Satan is doing in this culture. Christians are being neutered, Christians are being compromised over and over again because we have compromised our faith. We've compromised our testimony. We have fallen for the message of this world. We have embraced it. And he says, I can live in this world, and I can be a Christian at the same time. And Jesus Christ says, no. If you're a genuine Christian, there will be distinction in your life for Christ. You will love this world. You will love sinners. You will, you will have a soul winner's heart, but you will not compromise with this world. You will follow after my heart. That's what the church is being called to here. The battle is very real in our life. We see Satan. He disguises himself as an angel of light. We're not to be outwitted by Satan. He's constantly seeking to outwit you, and he can do that. He is scheming. He is a deceiver. He brings us to the place where we deceive ourselves. He will deceive you. Your friends will deceive you. The world will deceive you. He is a liar. Everything that the world throws at us, at believers, is a lie. He is an adversary, and he is aggressive. We see in Ephesians chapter 6, the antidote, we see the victory, we see the tool, the resources in our hands. It's the Word of God, the armor of God. Be strong in the Lord. Take this spiritual battle seriously. Be intentional. Put on that armor of God. Stand confidently in God's Word, His truth. Be right with God. Live, declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faithfully trust God. Always faithfully trust Him every day. Stand in the strength of relationship. That's the helmet of salvation. That is relationship. That's your confidence. Harness the power of God's word. Pray. Prayer is dependence. When I pray, I'm saying, God, I need you. And the Holy Spirit is the key in that, in that strength of prayer and engage in prayer for other people. And then he provides a pathway forward. How does he do that? He says, repent. Verse 16. Simply says it. Repent. Therefore, repent. You got to repent. You got to turn. You got to change your ways. You got to turn from the sin that has that has identified you. There's two. There's two. At, there's two groups who need repentance in the, in this passage. The first is the obvious. It is those who have compromised their faith. 
the Balak Balaam crowd, the Nicolaitan crowd, those that crowd there, they've compromised their faith. They've watered down their faith. They're trying to live in the world and live for Christ. It doesn't work. They're trying to have what they want and give Christ what he wants. It can't work. I can't serve two masters. I can only serve one. They need to repent. When we compromise with the world, when we're compromising in our life, we need to call it what it is. We need to identify it for what it is. We need to hate what it is. We need to hate what it's done to our life. And the Lord is going to call us back to, into relationship. He's going to call us back into, into a, a clean conscience. He's going to call us back to love Him again. That's what I need to do. The other group are those who, who are walking with the Lord. They're walking with the Lord faithfully, but they've lacked, they've lacked the courage to call out sin. They've lacked the courage to speak truth into the lives of those they love the most. They have let those that are in their life, that are compromising their faith, that have given their, their life over to, to idolatry or, or to Satan or to whatever, they don't have the courage to speak into their life. We have, we have sons and daughters and friends and family and neighbors that God gives us the ability to speak into their life with wisdom and with grace, with tactfulness, and yet with power. God calls all of us as to believers to be willing to have a boldness based on his word, not our opinion, not our thoughts, but based upon the truth of his word. He calls you all of us to be investing into the lives of others, to speaking truth into their lives so they may walk faithfully with the Lord. God's calling you, if you're a believer, he's calling you to walk faithfully with the Lord. He's calling me to walk faithfully with him. He's also calling you and I to faithfully speak into the lives of others who are believers so they might also walk faithfully with the Lord. That means addressing sin in their life. That's a hard thing to do. I know that. He knows that too. And he's given us what we need so that we can successfully do that. We need to repent. We would do that. We'd stop enabling those who are hurting themselves, hurting others, compromising. That's what compromise does. Um, this, these are the things that we need to do. He calls us to repent. Genuine repentance is confessing our sin. It's calling it what it is. Seeing, it's seeing that compromise as God does. There's no place for compromise in our life. It's, it's because repentance is genuine and real when it is, it brings fruit into our life. Matthew 3, 8. The fruit of the Spirit is brought into our life. The fruit of change, the work, the, the, the touch of Christ on our life is evident. When Jesus Christ touches your life truly, His work is evident in your life. People see it. When repentance is genuine, there's change. When there is, I'm sorry, I know I should have done that. When there's not genuine repentance, there's no touch of Christ in your life. When there's genuine repentance, there's genuine change. A life changes. An area of your life changes. It sparkles again for Christ. It's renewed and rekindled for Christ. That's what repentance does. And then he reminds us, you know what, you're not alone. Let me help you. Let me help you. To every church he says this, he does this. He reminds us of the Holy Spirit. In all seven churches, he calls us to remember this. It's so important every week. We are to listen to, to heed, to hear, to obey, to respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He will take the Word of God and use it in our life. We're to read it, we're to hear it, we're to keep it. That is key. And then Jesus reminds us of his enablement in our life. He and the Holy Spirit, they work in tandem. They work together in your life and mine. He reveals in our life. He is the revealer. He is the judge. He says, I am, a, I am the two-edged sword. And, and in verse 12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. It pierces into our life. And when it does, it accomplishes his work. It separates sinners from him. And it separates sin from the sinners, from the believers. The Word of God has that impact in our life. It changes us. It is a dis distinguishing factor in our life. It keeps sin away from us, and it keeps sinners away from Him. The truth is the standard in our life, the truth of God's Word. He reveals truth. He judges us. He assesses us. He evaluates us. He brings us to accountability based upon His Word. He probes our heart. We have nowhere to hide, nowhere to go. And so He calls us to repent. He says, repent. He says, if we don't repent, he says, I'm going to come soon. I'm going to war against them with the sword of my mouth. That is verse 16. 
If not, I will come to you soon. I will war against them with the sword of my mouth. He's, I'm going to come against you soon. That's not the coming at the end of Revelation. That is, I'm going to come in power with the authority of the Word of God, and I'm going to address this church. If you don't address it in your own church, I will, and it's, and it's, it's not going to be pretty. You may lose your light as a lampstand. You may lose your testimony as a church. You may lose your ability to be a church. I will address it. I will judge the sin. So judge the sin yourself. How does, he, how does He do this work in our life? He uses the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us of the need to be right with God, of our accountability that one day we're going to have with the Lord. That's the Holy Spirit's work. How does He do that? Well, He works in tandem with, the, with Jesus Christ. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is Christ. It is His Word. It is His Word that has that impact in our life. It, it probes and penetrates to every area of our life, the Spirit of God takes the Word and He does the work of Christ in our life. He transforms us. He conforms us to His image. He does the work of grace. But the work of grace sometimes is painful because it involves repentance. But it's always good. It's always transformative. Remember, Jesus is transforming our lives. It begins with the church. It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. He speaks into the life of the church first so that, as Ephesians says, He might make us holy. He might present us faultless and spotless and, and without spot before the Lamb. He, he, he wants us, He's accomplishing the work of, of transformation in our life. And so He speaks into our life that we might judge ourselves, assess ourselves, evaluate ourselves in lieu of God's standard, God's Word, so we might be right with God. That's repentance. We are accountable to Him. All of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be accountable to Him. The Lord is going to weigh everything we've ever done He's going to address that in our life. And so we're called to address that now, to deal with that now, to be right with God now, to walk forward in that in a right relationship now. God will honor and bless that when we do. The unbelievers, on the other hand, have a different accountability. This two-edged sword will speak into their life, but it will be permanent. It, it will be the, the full wrath of God, the fury of the wrath of God, this sharp sword coming from the mouth of Christ, the truth coming from the the mouth of Jesus Christ, which, which cannot be denied, which cannot be refuted, he will speak truth into the life of the unbeliever. And that truth will separate them from relationship in Christ for all eternity. That's the worst. So what do we do? We're called to examine ourselves. That's repentance. To judge ourselves. Jesus says to the church here in Corinth, many have been ill and sick and have died because of sin. You know, there is emotional sickness in our lives and mental sickness and spiritual sickness and physical sickness. And often it's tied back to spiritual spiritual sin. It's called, it's, it's been called back to sin. It ties back to sin in our life. We need to deal with that. It is perspective. It's a reminder to us that our hearts, we can't trust our hearts. We can't trust our own opinion of ourselves. We can't trust what the world says about ourselves. Jesus just reminds us here in Jeremiah and Proverbs, our heart is always evil. Our heart is always tainted by the sin by sin yes when we receive christ all who receive christ we are a new creation old things have passed away behold all things have become new but we still have this 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 uh impact of sin in our life the flesh is still in our life our heart we cannot trust it we must yield it to the lord continually it's repentance what it does it's positive in our life it reinforces good hope and and, and promise we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. He's not one who's, who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. You know, he knows. When we repent, what are we, what are we acknowledging? We're acknowledging our sin, but yes, we're acknowledging our weakness. We're acknowledging that we have failed. We're acknowledging that we just, we just, we've been boneheaded. We just couldn't do it. We simply weren't able. And he says, you know what? I know that. That's why I'm calling you to me in the first place. So you might come to me draw near with confidence to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help you. He says, with the sword of truth, I want to bring you to the place where you just run to the cross and run to the throne of grace and receive help. I'm using the truth of, of my word in your life so that you will find grace and mercy. It is an act of love. It is an act of God's absolute love for us. And he calls us to repentance so that we would receive the very strength, the very help we need to overcome. It is a retuning of the heart. We see that. David writes, clean, create in me a clean heart. David was commended because his heart was committed to this. 
God, I want to do your will. When we repent, our heart is retuned to this purpose, to this goal. It happens because the Word of God is being poured into our life. We're feeding on Him. We're feeding on Him. I've stored up Your Word in my heart that I might not sin, I might not compromise against You. You then become the, the strength of my life forever, the portion of my heart. You are mine. I know that. I run to You. It stands on God's promises. Who He is, Jesus Christ, He's promised to feed, to sustain us. That's what he's promised to do. Oops, here we go. He says, he says here in verse uh, 17, To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. He addresses the manna here. Jesus Christ says, I am the, I am the bread of life. He says, life, life for us is the word of God. That's life. Every day, nourishment for our soul. It's life. Because this is Christ. These words, these are the very life-giving words of Jesus Christ. When we let the Word of God pour into our life, it brings us satisfaction. We're satisfied. Compromise and sin always leaves us unsatisfied. We feel the shame, the guilt of that. We grow apathetic. We no longer have the joy of the Lord. The Word of God brings us back into relationship the Word of God brings us to the place of satisfaction. Obedience and faithfulness brings us to the place of relationship with Christ. And we're satisfied day in and day out when we honor His Word and are in that love relationship with Christ. He also promises to secure us, to affirm us. He says, I'm going to give you a white stone. We don't know exactly what this white stone is, but it's, it's, obviously, it's obviously a um, an affirmation from Christ. It was used. It was used in in uh, in athletic competition. Uh, a winner would win an event. And they'd be brought that back to the winner's circle later. He would be given this white stone, stone, so he could come in. It'd be used in a court scene when the sentence was given. If I was given a white stone, it was a it was a sentence of acquittal. I'm innocent. If I was given a black stone, it was given a it was a sentence of guilt, of judgment. Jesus says, "I'm giving a white stone here. It is as an affirmation. It is a prize to be valued." Uh, on that stone is going to be written a new name. It's going to be a unique name. Every believer is going to receive uh, something like this. We're going, to, we're going to receive a name that is unique to us. Will we get a, uh, will we get a, a, a literal white stone? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know that. I don't know. But we're going to receive a name that is unique to us. Somehow that it will communicate how we have lived for Jesus Christ, I believe. It's going to communicate our relationship with Christ uniquely. It'll say something about me that, that is no one else's. And Jesus Christ knows you. He knows me. He will honor that. I will secure you. I will give you a place. You have this ticket. You have this pass into glory. You have this affirmation of relationship, this white stone. And you have a name that is unique. I have given it to you. The name affirms not only that unique relationship, but it affirms the belonging. You belong to me to me. We have the 144,000 uh, Jews here in Revelation we're going to encounter. They're going to sing a song that is unique to them. We have Jesus Christ. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many crowns and he has a name. A name written that no one knows but himself. We're going to have a unique name. We're going to have a relationship that cannot be, un cannot be broken. The affirmation in that stone, that affirmation obviously in Christ and the Spirit of God who seals our relationship, that is eternal security at its, at its clearest. And he, he finishes here in chapter 22. And Jesus says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. He told the church here, I may come soon if you don't repent and deal with sin in the church. That's not the rapture there. It's not Jesus coming back. It's Jesus dealing with authority based on the truth of his word in the life of the church, bringing, bringing their witness to an end or continuing if they deal with it, with, uh, with God's grace, with strength. Now he says here to all of us, to all the church, I am coming back. May that be the motivation in our life. These three churches we've seen so far are intended to be motivation in our life, to love the Lord, to put him first, to be faithful to him, to not compromise in our, in our walk with the Lord. Uh, but to be accountable to Him. And so may the Lord do that in our life. May He speak into our life and, and bring us to that place. 
because he loves us. This is the place of blessing. May God honor that in our life by his grace. May we honor that call by yielding to the Spirit of God and to his word. May we not be compromisers. May we speak against compromise. May our testimony be strong for Jesus Christ. Lord, help us, we pray to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us. We'll see you again next week.